continuing our, our series on who is Jesus. And today I sort of entitled this message, you don't have to bring the slide up yet, Steve, so I'm going to show them the video first. Um, Heaven's Proclamation, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. But again, as of each week I've done this, I've shown you this opening on the street interview of people being asked, who is Jesus? And again, each time I watch it, I pick out something different. And honestly, the world needs to know. They need to know truly who the real Jesus is. Amen. Have a listen. Circle bear? I don't know. I think he was just a person. I don't know. Just a normal person? Like us? He was a selfless person. I have no clue. He was a man. I think he was marketing genius because he got people to believe him. I don't, I don't think he's the son of God. I don't believe that at all. If David Copperfield was in the day of Jesus, he would be Jesus. I'm pretty sure he existed, but I'm not gonna say that he didn't exist. He was God's son, but so was Gandhi, and so is Muhammad, and so is, you know, we're all God's children. Jesus is someone I pray to. Well, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, um, and he, to me, is the like symbol of his ultimate forgiveness and ultimate love. He's sort of that like constant figure in my life. Jesus is also Isa in Arabic, and he was a messenger as well. He was just extremely enlightened, like religiously and morally. He was somebody that um, just tried to um, impart wisdom on others and um, make the world a better place. I think he saw something that a lot of people didn't see and still don't see in others. And I, I think that's just a lot of love and, and hope. Jesus sort of seemed like an ominous uh, figure. You know, he just, he, he was God. And it was hard to relate to him. But I think as I've grown in my faith a lot, I've really started to see Jesus as my closest friend. Like one of the ones that sort of stood out to me this week was the one lady who said he was a marketing genius who got people to believe in him. Um, folks, like I said, I, I know I, I know we have dealt with this subject before. I'm sort of changing the name a little bit, but a lot of the information a lot of the information is the same. Because but again, we need to be reminded who Jesus is. I'm I'm very passionate about constantly keeping in front of you who Jesus is. Because I'm telling you, because in the time that we're dealing with right now. If we're not careful, if we're truly not rooted and grounded in the truth of the Word of God, in the truth of who Jesus is, about Him truly being our firm foundation, as we sang in that one song, our firm foundation, that He, He's our firm foundation, His love is our firm foundation, we could fall to, 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 to some falsehoods out there if we're not careful. All of a sudden, something doesn't go the way we think it should go. That's why I, I get I get amazed, and I, I'm, I'm gonna get to what I'm gonna talk about here in a second. I get amazed at how people who who supposed been serving the Lord for a long period of time and who were and who were supposedly um, on fire for Him, great Christians, and, and it seemed like they were, but all of a sudden, when something didn't go exactly the way they thought it should, that they believed the Word of God to be untrue and went, and went off a tangent and just started living for the devil. I've seen that happen. But the problem is, what has happened is they got rooted and grounded in the wrong thing. They were not rooted and grounded in the truth. We need to make sure what we're believing in is, is the truth. Not what man says. Not what this person says. Not what a church says. But what does the Word of God say? That's where we need to make sure that we're grounded. That's where we need to make sure that we place our hope and trust in. Because if not... I'm telling you, you need to let it straight. I believe the reason why Adam and Eve sinned was because they believed in a falsehood, that they believed something to be true. And again, I, I wasn't planning on going here today, but I'm going to share it real quick anyway. you got to remember, when, when God placed man in the garden, when He created Adam, God gave him one command, and what was it? Anybody remember, what was the one command that God gave Adam? Right, he said, you need any tree that's here except for the tree that's in the midst or the middle of the garden of that tree, you cannot eat. For the day you eat it, the day you eat it, you will die. But let's fast forward a little bit to when the serpent approaches Eve. When, 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 when the serpent asks Eve, can't you eat of every tree here? Did, did God say you truly can't eat of every tree here? Anybody remember, what was her response? 
He said, she said, you can't, we can't eat of the tree or touch it. And the first, and again, I always go back to the first thing the devil did was he attacked what he knew was a lie and he knew was false. He proved it to be wrong because again, she held it in her hand, nothing happened. What happened didn't happen until they took to the fruit. Now again, her taking the fruit, her eyes were open because the command wasn't given directly to her. And see, all the while, if you read the word there, Adam was there the entire time and let this whole thing transpire. And apparently he believed his own falsehood because I believe Adam is the one who added on to the Word of God. See, that's the danger of, of, of us trying to, to make... When we add on to God's Word, we, we, we find ourselves in trouble. So I want you to be rooted and grounded in the truth. What does the Word say about this? What does the Word say about Jesus? And this, and this whole series is based on a question that John the Baptist asked while he's in prison. Okay? In Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, this is what we read and we have used this as a basis each week that we have dealt with this series. It says, John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should we keep looking for someone else? And I have here, I said, the question that John the Baptist asked is a very valid one. Because we too, we must know the answer. We need to know the answer to that question. Is Jesus who He claims to be or isn't He? Is He who He claims to be or isn't He? And again, if you notice, I, I share this briefly each and every week that John says, are you the Messiah that we have been expecting? And I shared, how many shares for you? Each one of us, if I was to ask, I, I put it out there this way last week. I said, if I was to ask each one of you what you expected of me as your pastor, I guarantee you, I would get multiple different answers. Because it really depends on your upbringing. It depends on where you are in your stage of life. And different things like that. And I, and I use that as, a, as an example to help you understand is, a lot of people are the same way about Jesus. And when we get to the, the message, I'm going to reiterate again this week, what, what the, most, the, most, the greatest thing that he came to do, I'm not going to jump ahead of myself, but I'm, but I'm going to tell you what the greatest thing he came to do, which is this is the expectation we all need to have. And, we, and if we allow him to fulfill this expectation that I talk about in the message, it will radically transform the way you view Jesus Christ. Amen? So, like I said, so we need to know the answer to, to this question too. And we need to make sure that our expectation is correct because, again, I don't want to go back. You can jump back to two weeks ago when I dealt with this question with John asking it about some possibilities why John may have been asking this. But last week, I dealt with some of his qualifications. I'm telling you, we're looking at it. What makes him, what qualifies him as being the Messiah? What qualifies him as being the Christ? What qualifies him as being the one? And last week, we talked about prophecy. And I said, remember I told you that there's over 300 prophecies in the Bible about the Messiah. And then from there, I went in and I showed you, I, did, I shared with you the science of, of what? Probability and statistics. And I, and I told you, I just brought up a simple thing. I said, you know, for, for one person to fulfill just eight prophecies out of 300 prophecies, for one person just to fulfill that in their lifetime, it is the possibility of 1 to 10 to the 17th power. That is 100 quadrillion, which is a, a, a 10 with 17 zeros behind it. That's a big number. And that's just 8, remember? And then they took it to 1 in 48. And that was 1 to, that was one to 10 to, to the 157th power. Statistical improbability, if my memory serves me right, is 10 to the 312th power. And when I did some rough math, if you take all of the prophecies and you figure it out, it comes down to either 10, it comes down to 10, between 10 to the 600 and some power, to 10 to the 900 and some power, which is two to three times statistically impossible. So if it's statistically impossible, three times, two to three times over, and yet he fulfilled all 300, what should that be screaming to you? 
It's true. He is who he claims to be. And that's what we dealt with last week when we were dealing with looking at his qualification to be the Messiah of what the prophecy says. Well, today I want to look at this thought. What do the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the angels proclaim about Jesus? Hence, why I put the title this morning was Heaven's Proclamation. What, do the, what, what, what did the Father, what did the Holy Spirit, and what did the angels say about this one named Jesus, or this one who, who, who is called Jesus? Again, when I go back to the opening video of the interview, um, I get amazed. That, again, that's why pe people need to know. That's why we as a church, we need to make sure that we're living the true Jesus before them. That we're presenting the true Jesus before them because there were a lot of different answers on there. And even the ones, even the ones who profess to believe in Him, some of the responses they gave, I, I was sort of scratching my head a little bit too. Um, but but, but not, not completely about it. It's just about certain things that they said. Um, and it may just be, I just may have understood, I may have misunderstood their statement. Okay? But, but we need to really know and understand who is Jesus. What does the Bible have to say about that? So today, like I said, we're going we're gonna to look at this. So does the, do the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the angels proclaim that He is the one, the Christ, and the Messiah? Let's dive into the Word today and see what it has to say. In Luke chapter 1, Verses 30 through 35. Listen to what it says here. Do not be afraid, Mary, the angel told her. So first off, who's getting ready to make a proclamation here? An angel. An angel of the Lord. For you, have, for you have found favor with God, and you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. For he will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, But how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of of God. So we see an angel proclaiming it. The angel proclaiming what the Holy Spirit's going to have something to do with it. And then also the angel's proclaiming that he's going to have a, a direct connection to who? The Father. So we see everybody I named so far is, is, is in this in this message here. But did you notice he said you shall call him Jesus. That's the term we use. This, the, the Hebrew term, if I'm not mistaken, would be Yeshua. Does anybody know what, what Yeshua means? What, or literally what Jesus means? God saves. It's the same as Joshua. Joshua means, or Joshua in, in the actual Hebrew term would be Yeshua. God saves. <laughs> so literally, he, and understand that the Bible is, is when you read the Bible, when, when, when individuals are given names, they're given names for a, a reason. It's just not, you know, um, why did I, I don't, I don't think we really had a reason why we picked Joshua. We just like Joshua, I think. She may correct me, she's watching me now, so she may go and say, no, honey, that was wrong. But again, until yeah. she gets up and does that, I'm just going to tell you what I'm saying right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. We, we didn't go to, we, I, honestly, I don't remember, because we're going back now almost 33 years. Yeah, right? Yeah, almost 33 years. And I uh, had to think about when he was born again. Uh, and say, oh, I, I think, oh, blessed Heavenly Father, what name should I give my son? My firstborn. And, and all of a sudden I didn't have an epiphany. <gasps> His name should be Joshua. I, I think I just like the name Joshua. All I knew is I didn't want a junior, and I said, he's not being named after me. Hence why he's Joshua David. My name's in his name, but it's not his first name. And uh, same thing uh, when it came to care, we just liked the name. Now, Jordan, there is a story behind the name of Jordan. <laughs> Had nothing to do with God, but just, or at least we tell people why we use the name Jordan. Uh, but that's another story for another time. Huh? You can't be the same. You better know it. All right, well, yeah. well Jordan, Jordan was our surprise child. 
Well, we always tell her she was our love child. She was our surprise child. And we knew that, that she was going to be the last child that we had, unless we adopted or something like that. We knew she was the last child. So I said, yeah, we're going to call it Jordan, because this is the last time I was going to have to cross the Jordan River. So, <laughs> so and, her la and her middle name is Alyssa, the one Alyssa time John was going to cross the Jordan. So. <laughs> Alyssa, one. Never mind. All right. <laughs> Instead of last, I'll list it one list of time. Uh, all right. Yeah, whatever. One is probably because she's just right now saying, he is so wrong. He is so wrong. And I'm going to have to correct him when I get upstairs. <laughs> but you're not up here right now. All right. All right. <laughs> But I brought this up to you, this portion of scripture here, because first of all, I wanted to start where the proclamation. Again, I know proclamations began earlier in the Bible. I can pull out the prophecy of Isaiah and all that stuff, but I wanted to start in the New Testament where Mary is approached first. Because originally, in order for Joseph to be, you know, even though we read the story of Joseph first in the New Testament because it's in Matthew, Mary was approached first because in order to what happens next in Matthew to happen, Mary had to be approached. And you'll get what I, what I mean here. But but she was to call his name Jesus, which means God saves. So there was something already being declared very special about this one that was going to be born to her. But also what was special was she says, I'm a virgin. You know, how can I be pregnant? I've, I've never had sex with anybody. And it's like the angel just says, oh, Mary, don't worry about it. God's going to take care of it. Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And, and you're going to have the Immaculate Conception. Yeah, which that is what it's, it's, it's called. Um, but then in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, this is what the Word tells us. It says, This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the wedding, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. So right here, you know something that, that she's by now, at this time, she's pregnant. What we read earlier said, What? You're going to become pregnant. And now we read she is pregnant. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. And as he considered this, an angel, so he's making a proclamation, an, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she shall she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, Yahshua, for he will save his people from their sins. Hence, Jesus means what? Save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, and she will give birth to a son, and they shall call him. Emmanuel. So this is another name of the Lord, which means what? God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife, and he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. So again, you're seeing that there, there is... This, this baby that this woman named Mary had, there's been some very specific proclamations made about this child. First of all, it was, it was a miracle that she became pregnant because she was a virgin. And it, then after she became pregnant, the angel has, steps in again to tell her fiance, hey look, it's okay. What's being done is done is being done by the Spirit of God. So, so, so don't be afraid to take her. She hasn't been unfaithful to you. Fact is, he's going to be the son of he's the son of God. You will name him Jesus, which means God saved. And also people are going to call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So not only is he the God that saves, he's now also God in the flesh. He's God with us. Which leads to a lot of things later down when he says, you know, it's expedient that I go away and the comforter come, because when the comforter comes, he shall be not only with you, but be in you, which means then not only do we have God with us, we have God in us. And all this happened by this one name, Jesus. And these are the proclamations. First off, that are being made by the angel, and you can see where the Holy Spirit and where God the Father is all involved in this. In Luke chapter 2, 
verses 10 through 14. We read this. It says, but the angel reassured them. So again, it's an angel making a proclamation. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring, that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you, will, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel is joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, peace on earth for those with whom God is Please. So again, make a proclamation. Something special. This one name, Jesus, the Savior, has been born. And you'll recognize Him because when you find Him, this is how He's going to appear. And we know as you read further on the story, when the shepherds went, what did they find? They found Mary and Joseph and the babe the way that the angels proclaimed. So all of a sudden there was something. Then they went about saying everything they seen and heard. They began to publish it around. People said, what's going on? Little did the world realize because again, as John asked, are you the one we've been expecting? And they're sharing this stuff, and people are saying, okay, what's happening? All the while, they were expecting the Messiah to come away that, 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 that God did not intend for him to come. They, they said, this is the way it's going to happen, this is the way it's going to happen, and God flipped the playbook and did it this way. That's what I'm saying. We need to make sure what we believe is rooted and grounded in the Word because they were not expecting Him to come the way He came. We know that the nation in general rejected who Jesus is. We know the nation of Israel in general rejected who Jesus is because He did not come and fulfill their expectation the way that they expected because somehow, in some way, they got rooted and grounded in something that was what? False. That's what I'm saying. It's very important that we need to make sure that we are rooted and grounded in the truth. Make sure we're rooted and grounded in the Word of God. Hence why we're going on to this again. Because what we're going through, I want you to know, I want you to know here and here that He is the Messiah. That He is the Savior of the world. That He is the Son of the living God. In Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 32, we read this account. And at that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly awaiting, and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. And I'm going to stop this again. That there sort of gives us a hint what they were expecting Messiah to do. Because that is one of the, the, the keys. The, the Messiah is supposed to truly rescue Israel from all of their oppressors. The problem was they failed to understand the timing of it. The greatest need to guess, they needed to, to be delivered from their oppressors, but they, they didn't understand that the greatest oppressor they needed to be delivered from was the bondage of sin. And they didn't understand that's what the Messiah truly came to do. They were looking at an earthly thing, an earthly kingdom. Hence, which God, that's what I'm saying. We need to make sure that what we're rooting ground in the truth, guys, okay? And again, you know, make sure what you believe in is what the Bible says. Not what some minister says, not what some prophecy expert says, or anything else. Make sure it's what the Word says. Amen? Not there. I'm not their belief of what it should be or whatever. Because um, I'm going I'm to pause here one second. Uh, because in the first church I pastored, this isn't the first church I pastored, but in the very first church I pastored, I got in a discussion with an individual about the book of Revelations. And this individual was so determined that this is exactly the way it's going to happen. And all this stuff, because this is what all the, the prophecy teachers at that time were saying that, that X, Y, Z is going to transpire, and da 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 da, da. And, and, and this individual is taking his gospel. And I said, "Well, wait a second. I said, all the experts of the day were saying that, that the Messiah was coming this way. And guess what? They were wrong. The Father already knows how he's going to work this stuff out. And again, and don't, I'm, I'm not saying these guys are false prophets. I'm just simply saying they're humans. They're, 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 and, and le, unless, unless it's truly God coming down and saying, telling them verbatim, saying this is exactly what I'm doing here, understand, 
They're, they're going off of best educated guess. God already knows how He's going to make things transpire. And we just need to keep our eyes upon Him and trust Him. And when I had this conversation with her, she got mad and she stopped coming to our church. Because I did not agree with her on, on, on a book that, 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 that you can have multiple different ways of looking at it. Again, I wasn't saying she was wrong. I'm just saying, look, you know, don't get so rooted ground in this that you don't let God be God and take care of the way He wants to take care of it. And then that's the thing I'm saying. Certain things, unless we know it's in black and white that this is 100% the way it is, don't put your all your eggs in there. You know? Stand on what you know is the truth. And then you'll never be led astray. So, he says, uh, he was eagerly awaiting the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. And, he, and when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there and he took the child in his arms and praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised, I have seen your salvation, which you have, which you have prepared for all people. He is the light. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. Here's here's Simeon. The Holy Spirit moved upon him. The Holy Spirit gave him knowledge that he was going to see the Messiah, and then when he saw the Messiah, he began to speak. And actually, his words of prophecy came true. Actually, it was just something completely different what Israel expected, because Israel thought the Messiah was just going to be about Israel. But when you read what Simeon says, you can see what where we are included. Do, do you see it there? Do you see where we're included in what, in the, what he declared about this one named Jesus? It just wasn't just about Israel. So what did he say there? Which you have prepared for all people. He is the light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory, and the, but he is the glory of your people, Israel. Yes, he's an Israeli, he's an Israelite, and, 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 and you know, and, and, and it's going to give glory to, to the nation of Israel, but he is for everyone. See, that's something else they really didn't understand. And I don't even know if Simeon realized what he was really prophesying at the time and what he was declaring. But here, we see that there's something special about this little baby who was born who then named Jesus, who in, the, who, in the, who in the Hebrew would be Yeshua. God saves. We see it brought out again. Then in John chapter 1, verses 32 through 34, it says, then John, this is what John the Baptist, this is the one who asked the question. Now this is before he was in prison. Because we know it had to be before he was in prison because he never left prison. The way he left prison was without his head. He, he left. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one but when God sent me to baptize with water, He told me. Who told Him? God told Him. The one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And John says, I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that He is the chosen one of God. So here, John testifies through a, a word of knowledge from the Lord that, that the Holy Spirit moved upon him and said, when you, see, when you see the Holy Spirit wrestle upon an individual you baptize, He's the one. He says, I'm now telling you, I've seen this happen. This is what the Spirit of God revealed to me. And He is the one. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the chosen one. Why? Because He saw what happened to Jesus. And all that, He says, He's going to be the one to, to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with, and with fire. So again, we're, we're seeing through... Even though God is he uses some different people in different ways, we see where God is declaring all around Jesus' life before he begins ministry that, that there's something unique about him, especially. God is declaring heaven is proclaiming he is the one, he is the Messiah, he is the Christ. So again, I want you to understand we can know that Jesus is who he says he is, and it just doesn't stop there. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, 
After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like the dove and setting on him. So again, John sees this happening, but now listen to what else happens. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. So God the Father now declares audibly, This is my Son. And you almost like saying, How much more evidence do you need? But again, I, I want you just to understand. He is. He is the one. Again, later on in Matthew, Matthew, Matthew chapter 17, verse 5, it says, but even as he spoke, Peter was speaking. They were up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus was being transfigured before them. And Peter didn't know what to say, so Peter just began to talk. He began to rattle off things. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. Listen to him. We see that God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and the heavenly angels proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah. That He is the one. And He also used human agents to declare it also through the unction of divine revelation. So is He the one that we've been expecting? Or should we look for another? We don't have to look for anybody else. He is the one we've been expecting. Prophecies about him were revealed, as I talked about last week. And again, the odds of him fulfilling all those prophecies are so astronomical. Like I said, it's two to three times past. Statistically impossible. And yet, he did it. And yet people say, well, I don't know if he's the son of God or not. He's a marketing genius. If David Copperfield would have been alive back then, he'd be the Messiah. Jesus was not a con man. Jesus was not an illusionist. Jesus was not a marketing Jesus, a mar marketing a genius. <laughs> He's exactly who the Word of God declares He is. He is the Son of the one and only living God. He's the one and only Son of the one and only living God. That is who Jesus is. And this is what heaven has proclaimed. This is heaven's proclamation about this one named Jesus. So again, why did God go through all this trouble? As I said last week, I believe that God wanted Jesus to have all the qualifications He needed so we would have no doubt in surmising that He is the Messiah. Again, I'm sure you've heard this too, and I've shared this before too. Many of the great apologists, and what an apologist is, is someone who defends the Word, the Word of God, someone who defends the faith. Many of the apologists who are, who are great apologists for the kingdom of God at one time a day were actually either agnostic or atheist. They, they either said, we don't, we don't know if God is real or not, we really don't know, or they profess that God doesn't exist. But when they actually went in, when they actually went in and started to try to discredit who Jesus is and tried to disprove the Bible as they truly looked at the evidence and they did the research they were also confronted with the truth that what the Bible declares is true because we could dive into how do we know the Bible is accurate and I may do that at the end of this message series how can we know we can trust the Bible and you know I've done this before but sometimes we need to be reminded of this stuff just to encourage us and remind us that what we believe is true it's just, yes, we, we still have to take it in faith. Example. We know this is a chair, and we know this chair is designed for people to sit on. We know that's true. Am I right? But until you exercise the faith to do this, You'll never experience the fact that that's what it was designed to do. You can know it all you want, but if you never put that knowledge into action, you'll never experience the purpose of what this thing was designed for. We may know things, people may know things about Jesus, but until they put it into practice, 
until they experience who he is, it does them no good like this chair just sitting there collecting dust and never used to actually give somebody a moment of relaxation or whatever. God wanted him to have all the qualifications so we would know, so that we would know that we would know. But again, it's more than a head knowledge. It's a heart knowledge, but it's a heart knowledge because it's a head knowledge, but it's all done in faith. We, we receive him and believe in him for who he is. But as I hinted to at the beginning of the message, I said, yet the most exciting thing about Jesus is that he came to change lives. The greatest thing that he came to do was to change lives. And he did that by paying the price of sin for each and every one of us. But yet, he came to change life. He alone, he alone has fulfilled the greatest prophecy of all, the promise of a new life. And it's available to anyone, any, who will accept it and receive it. And as we sit in somewhere, it wasn't just limited to Israel. Because he came to be what? The hope of all people. He came to be the hope of the nations. Not nation, nations. It's available to all who will receive. He's available. To all. This what he's, he's, and, it, and it comes through him. I end the message with this por these portions of Scripture here. I'm in the message again today with these three portions of Scripture. Like I said, He alone has fulfilled the greatest prophecy to give us a new life. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 says, God speaking through Ezekiel says, And I will give you a what? A new, a new heart. And I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. This is a creative work of God Almighty. When you come to believe and know who Jesus Christ is and put your faith and your trust in Him, all of a sudden He comes in and He does some type of miraculous thing in you and He gives you a new heart and a new spirit. Literally, He changes who you are. That's when you know someone's really been saved. When you see a noticeable difference about their life. There has to be no solution. Why? Because there's a new heart and there's a new spirit, which means you should have new. What's that one's on? I got a new attitude. You know, you know, I don't know the rest of the song, but that, that, that little bit of that work just came to my mind. All this is because of Jesus. And as you see the other verse up there that, that, that's with this, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The King James puts it, a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. He alone fulfilled this. And He alone is the one who offers this to us if only we'll receive it. It's available to anyone. Because that's what Jesus Christ Himself has shared when He was talking to Nicodemus in that evening in John chapter 3, when we read verses 16 through 18. For God loved the world so much that He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. Jesus came to save. He came to give us a new life. He came to do exactly what His name said. Yahshua. Which means what? God saves. He came to save the world through Him. And in verse 18 again, the key is verse 18. You've got to have these three together. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in Him. But anyone who does not believe in Him has already been judged for not believing God's one and only do you believe He is the Messiah? When, I, when I'm talking about, about believing, I'm not just talking about just having a head knowledge. I'm talking about that belief is talking about a belief in action. Do you believe He's the Son of God? 
And yes, Lord, I do because I'm going to change the word here. I'm going to sort of change what this is underneath me. I'm sitting on the rock. I'm trusting in the rock. Amen. I'm going to ask other musicians to come. And we're just going to close with a song and a prayer. And here, and here, and here's the greatest thing. I guess the reason why, you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir here this morning. I know many of you have heard what I've, what I've, what I've declared to you again today. And I said, but we need to be reminded of this. But maybe somewhere along the road, if we weren't careful, maybe we allowed maybe a falsehood to come in. Maybe, maybe we allowed our mind to sort of to think about what we desire instead of what He desires. And all of a sudden, we can allow that to come in and impact and affect how we do things or, or, or why we do things. Well, let's truly get our minds focused back then. It's, it's about Jesus. And let's come to a place where Lord say, I, I want to be rooted and grounded in You and in You alone. And if we're right now across our nation, we're hearing of spikes in the virus spread. In fact, it somewhat seems like it's intentional, you know, when they're having COVID parties. Because they know more than likely if they get it, it will truly not affect them whatsoever. Understand, folks, we live in a selfish, self-centered world. And we are called to be completely different than that. Through this one name, Jesus. And we can be completely different, different than that through this one name, Jesus. He come to give you a new life. And hopefully you've experienced it. If you have it, it's there for you. You can receive it. He's there ready waiting. But like I said, maybe, maybe, somehow, maybe, maybe you, you, you maybe, maybe, maybe you're just struggling. And you say, Lord, you know, I'm glad I'm rehearing this because I want to be reminded about who you are. I want to be refreshed in my, in my understanding or my knowledge of you. And just say, Lord, you are awesome. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me a new life. And just let me just once again be rooted and grounded in the truth of who you are. That you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the one. And I place my hope and my trust in you. See, you know, even when we even miss our while, sometimes we need, we need to do some self-reflecting, don't we? Make sure our motives are where they're, they're supposed to be. We, again, we don't want to run this race for a long time and all of a sudden find out we're running in the wrong direction. So make sure we're rooted grounded in the Word. Make sure we're rooted grounded in who Jesus is. So heaven's proclamation, I think it declared pretty, pretty, pretty simply, pretty plainly that this one named Jesus who was born over 2,000 years ago He is the Messiah. And he is the Christ. back there and you can if you want to do that that's fine too God, God understands okay but what is something inside you says I just need to go to the altar do that do that okay don't, don't, don't say well I can't I don't care what the government says when it comes to that you just walk truly by the leading of the spirit Sing this with us and say, Jesus is the answer.